Well, as we come to the word, let's do so in prayer this morning. Father, we do thank you so much for your word is truth. Father, we don't recognize these as simply pages or words on a page. Father, we don't uh, see these words as simply inspiring as is other writings, but Father, these are inspired writings. They are God-breathed. They are your words to us. They are truth. And so, Father, we would ask that you would open our eyes to the truth that you have for us. Truth regarding yourself, truth regarding Jesus, your Son, and our Savior, and truths about ourselves. So, Father, to that end, we pray that uh, you would work by the presence of your Holy Spirit to that end. To your glory and to the glory of Christ Jesus, for we ask it in his name. Amen. There we go. Well, this year, it's been a little different in terms of our run-up to Easter Sunday. <clears throat> Typically, in the past, I've had a, a Lenten season sermon series. Uh, last year, we went through and spent several weeks in Isaiah chapter 53 as we sort of tore that passage apart, that chapter apart, into four or five messages looking at what's been called the gospel in the Old Testament. But, but this year, I haven't had a chance to do that. We have been in 2 Corinthians and felt like that was time well spent in that book as we, we looked at the series titled Comfort and Strength. So we finished that last Sunday, and so we have one Sunday uh, here to get our, our Easter shoes, our, our Easter running shoes on and get to up to speed during this season. So here we are on Palm Sunday with Easter Sunday, a mere seven days away. And John records what happened on that first Palm Sunday. John chapter 12, as we saw, says this. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Well, as, as I read those familiar words, my, my curiosity kicked in, and I began to wonder, and I began to notice that those words are in quotation marks. The crowds, they weren't coming up on with these shouts on their own. They were quoting something. Well, what I discovered was that the third of the quotations, blessed is the king of Israel, it's not a quotation from anywhere in the Old Testament, but it was simply a conclusion that the crowd there in Jerusalem had drawn and reached of their own accord. They had determined, they had decided that Jesus coming into Jerusalem was the king of Israel. And to be honest, Jesus sort of manipulated that. What did he do? He went and he said, get me that donkey's colt, and I will ride into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Well, if you knew your Bible, you knew that, well, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 has something to say about that. And so Jesus, in a sense, he was bringing that idea to the minds of the people of Israel. That this is the long-anticipated Messiah and King. So that was their conclusion. Blessed is the King of Israel. There's the King. He is here. But the first two quotations, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord are, as we saw this morning, quotations from Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. Psalm 118 is a song which celebrates God's deliverance of his people in a time of great national despair. Things were not going well for the kingdom of Israel. The psalm celebrates God's gracious intervention on behalf of his people at a time when all seemed lost. 
Well, what I found intriguing is that Jesus' last week on earth began and ended with the psalm, with the words of Psalm 118 ringing in his ears. On Sunday afternoon, as he entered Jerusalem, the crowds proclaimed their hope that Jesus was the long-awaited conquering king who would break the shackles of the Roman Empire and usher in a new day of prosperity and freedom for the people of Israel. That the kingdom would be renewed because the king had come. And so as Jesus came into Jerusalem, he did so to these words of the Old Testament in his ears. Hosanna, which means, O Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's how the week started. How did the week draw to conclusion? On Thursday evening, by then the crowds had dispersed, and Jesus is found in the upper room celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples. We're told in Matthew chapter 26, verse 30, that when they had sung a hymn following the Passover meal, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, the, the Jewish Passover meal was very well scripted. You, you didn't say, when you gathered together for the Passover as Jewish people, you, you didn't say, you know, we're going to do something a little different this year. We're going to spice it up. We're, we're going to go a little different. You didn't do that. It was defined. This is how the celebration of the Passover is to be done. And it always went the same trajectory. The same words, the same scriptures. And the Passover celebration always ended with the reading of Psalm 118. And so at the beginning of the week, there was rotations from that psalm. By the end of the week, Psalm 118 was on Jesus' lips. Now, sometime during the Holy Week, I always try to read Psalm 118 and to hear it as Jesus would have heard it that night. It's amazing. Take some time this week to read Psalm 118. Try as best you can to place yourself in Jesus' shoes and to try to hear it how this would have sounded to him. Verse 25. Jesus is getting ready to go to his crucifixion. What does it say? This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You go through the whole psalm, it is like Jesus' life, of his experience is being played out just as it is found in this chapter. So when they had sung a hymn, when they had sung Psalm 118, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The Passover meal always ended with the singing of that hymn. Every time the same hymn. On Sunday, the crowd sang it in hopes that Jesus would deliver them from the Romans. On Thursday evening, Jesus sang it as he steeled himself to deliver the people from their sin. Jesus was a king. According, the, the crowds had it right. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus was a king, but he was not the kind of king the people wanted. But he was the kind of king the people truly needed. Jesus is a king unlike any other king because he alone can save us from the tyranny, from the destructive power of sin and death and Satan. This morning as we look at a variety of passages from Psalm 118, these words point us to five experiences of Jesus during the hours following the Passover meal in the upper room through his crucifixion. Experiences which he endured not for our, 
not for his own sake, but for our sake. Experiences which have shown him to be not the kind of king the Jews wanted, but the kind of king that all mankind needed. So let's take a look. The first thing that we know this from Psalm 118 is this. We're reminded that King Jesus experienced anguish in the garden. The psalmist writes, In my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered me. The gospel writers speak of Jesus' emotional state in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew records that that Jesus began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Now, now the same word and the same root underlines both words there in the text. There's the same root for sorrowful and overwhelmed with sorrow. The only difference is the addition of a prefix to the second. That prefix intensifies the meaning of the first underlined word. Matthew's words suggest that with every passing moment, Jesus' sorrow and his fear was growing and intensifying. Luke adds these words to the picture. Being in anguish, Jesus prayed more earnestly. The the Greek word here that that we translate in English as, as anguish is the word agonia. Agonia. From there we get our, our, our English word, right? Agony. And, and the, the word agony, agonia, it, it described an athletic contest or a battle between individuals where one was trying to, to gain dominance over the other or to, to win the victory. But it was not only used to describe a physical conflict, but also here in this case an emotional conflict. Conflict. There was a conflict going on within Jesus. He was in agony. There was this anguish. There was this conflict within him. And the conflict is apparent in his three times repeated prayer. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. So there's, there's that war. There was that battle. Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. They're in the garden faced with the excruciating horror of crucifixion. But more than that, faced with an unfathomable prospect of being cut off from fellowship with his father. Jesus cried out in anguish and agony, yearning for a plan B. If it is possible, let us turn the page and find another way for you to save mankind. And the father said, there is no plan B. There is no other way. This is the only way. It's worth noting that the word anguish is never associated with Jesus while he hung on the cross. It's never said that while he was on the cross that Jesus was in anguish. Oh, he was in pain. But there's no internal conflict. Should I do this or not? Should I follow my father's will or not? That was settled in the garden. There was no agony on the cross. There was pain. But his decision, his determination had already been made. He was resolved. That had been settled. That internal conflict had been settled on his knees with his father in the garden. The relief from anguish he received also finds expression in the psalmist's words. In my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered me by setting me free. Free from what? From that internal conflict. From his fear. The Lord is with me. I I will not be afraid. What can man do to me besides kill me and take my physical life? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. King Jesus experienced anguish in the garden, but he also experienced the hostility of the nations or from the nations. Look at verses 10 and 12 of Psalm 118. 
all the nations surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees. Now, with apologies for any beekeepers here, that's not a good thing as far as I'm concerned to be surrounded by bees. I remember back when I was probably in junior high, our family went camping up by the Illinois River, up by Ottawa. And uh, I was an adventurous soul, and you had a path from the river up to the campground, but I made my own path. I decided to scramble up a hill, do a little climbing. And I, I grabbed onto a limb, and on the other end of the limb, or in the ground by the end of the limb, there was a beehive. And before I knew it, I was in the midst of these raging bees. Well... The first thing I thought to do was go jump in the river and get away from them. So I, I sort of fell, crash landed down this hill. My sister saw me. She thought I'd hit my head and, and knock myself or knock myself crazy because I started running as fast as I could. I got to the river. I was about to throw myself in. But there were only three or four around me by that time, and I swallowed them with my shirt. I ended up with 26 bee stings through that. So you'll forgive me if I... Don't take up beekeeping as a hobby. He says, they, they swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. From, from the Jewish perspective, the world consists of two types of people. There, on the one hand, you have the Jews. That's one type of people. And on the other hand, you have everybody else. In the garden, Jesus was first surrounded by the Jewish temple guard who had come to arrest him. The, the Jewish leaders then handed him over to Pilate, the Roman governor of Palestine, because they could not inflict capital punishment. Only the Romans could do that. So the Jewish leaders handed Jesus over to Pilate, the governor of Palestine. In the Jewish mind, he was surrounded. Jesus was swarmed by all the nations, Jew and Gentile. Everyone was opposed to Jesus. It's interesting, following Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven, when faced with hostility towards themselves, the disciples prayed this. Why do the nations, see that plural, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gathered together against the Lord and against the anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate, Jew and Gentile, met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus. In that sense, the whole world aligned itself against Jesus. But as the psalmist foresaw, Christ prevailed over every foe. In the name of the Lord, the psalmist says, I cut them off. I gained the victory. And so it was with Jesus. King Jesus experienced anguish in the garden. He experienced hostility from the nations. And he also experienced the wrath of God. Verse 18, the psalmist writes, The Lord has chastened me severely. One of the reasons Jesus died on the cross was to appease the wrath of God Toward sin. God himself removed his holy wrath towards sin by providing a substitute. As John Piper has written in his book, The Passion of Jesus Christ, he, he writes this, the substitute, Jesus Christ, does not cancel the wrath. He absorbs it and he diverts it to himself. God's wrath is just and it was spent. 
It was not withdrawn. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, the gospel in the Old Testament, the prophet gives further expression to this reality. Yet, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. It was the Lord's will. It was his Father's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. The King James Version, the New American Standard, is even more poignant than that. It's more stark. It pleased the Lord to crush him. On Calvary, God's wrath toward sin was diverted from mankind and poured out upon Jesus. He died the just for the unjust. He who knew no sin became sin for us, so that by his stripes we are healed. We hear the depths of Jesus' suffering as he cries from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because this mankind's sin was poured upon him. And the Father, in his holiness, could not look upon his Son, who bore the sin of all men. The song, the hymn, In Christ Alone, co-authored by Keith Getty and Stuart Townsend, is fast becoming the modern equivalent to Amazing Grace. Would you agree with that? In many ways, the, the, the song that we have known from earliest childhood, Amazing Grace, is being not supplanted, but is being buoyed by In Christ Alone. Townsend and Getty, they, they got together, and the first time they were ever working together, they had just met, actually this has been introduced and encouraged to work together, and so they got together and, and Keith Getty said, you know, I have in my mind a, a song, I'd like to, to do a song that, that proclaims the entirety of the gospel. And they shared ideas among themselves, and what came from it was in Christ alone. And it has, is becoming a favorite hymn of the Christian church. The interesting thing is that it has become so popular that some have started to want to include it in their hymnals. Denominations, well, let's, let's, let's put this in a hymnal. And so they were, pre, they were approached by one denomination, and they said, we, we would like to include in Christ alone in our new denominational hymnal. And they said, sure, that, that would be fine. But the leader said, but, but one thing, one thing. We, we, we find offense in, in one line of your song. See, the song says, till on the cross... As Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. No, he said, we don't want to talk about God's wrath. Let's replace that with this. Till on the cross, as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. Well, there's truth in that. But those words take away the reality of what Christ bore on Calvary for us. And so Getty and Townsend, they stood firm to the biblical witness that God's wrath against sin was poured out on Jesus so that it may not be poured out on us. J.I. Packer, in his book Knowing God, has written, God is not just unless he inflicts upon all sin and wrongdoing the penalty it deserves. And thus he did on Jesus. Jesus. As he sang the words of Psalm 118, he was reminded of that which lay ahead of him, the chastening of the Father. The wrath of God laid upon him, not for his sin, but for ours. King Jesus experienced the wrath of God. But even that, even in the reality of God's wrath poured out upon him for sins that were not his own, there was the light of hope. As the psalmist writes in verses 17 and 18, I will not die, but live. The Lord has chastened me severely for the sins of others. 
but he has not given me over to death. There was a resurrection. King Jesus experienced the wrath of God, but he also experienced the rejection by men. The psalmist continues in verse 22 with these words, the stone the builders rejected. Now, it should not be missed that on Tuesday, following his entry into Jerusalem on Sunday, Jesus applied these very words to himself. He understood that the words of the psalmist pointed forward and directly to him. Rejection. The stone the builders rejected. Jesus knew rejection from early on in his ministry. His co-worshippers in the in his home synagogue of Nazareth, they rejected him. And, and the rich young ruler left him, went away sad, rejected Jesus and his counsel and his words. And many of his so-called disciples rejected Jesus. But along with this thread of small-scale privatized rejection by individuals and smaller groups of individuals, there was also a large-scale systematic rejection by the power brokers among the Jews. Mark chapter 3, verse 16, we read, Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. The Pharisees and the Herodians working in concert with one another. Who would have ever thought that it would be like Republicans and Democrats working together for the common good? But the Herodians and the Pharisees realized they had a common enemy for different reasons, but they had a common enemy. The Pharisees were devout followers of the Torah and the law of Moses, and, and they wanted no political fraternation whatsoever with Rome. The Herodians were among those who supported Rome. Rome appointed Herods, kings, as their rulers in Palestine. And the Herodians went along with the Romans so that they could get along. And, and so the only point of of commonality between the Pharisees and the Herodians was their hatred for Jesus. This, in, in Mark chapter 3, verse 6, this was Jesus during Jesus' first year in public ministry. And both groups concluded that Jesus was a threat to their religion and to their power and to their way of life and that he must go. He was not a Messiah. He was a spiritual charlatan in whom was not, a, not truth but deception. That he was not from God, but from Satan. The rejection built as Jesus' ministry continued for two additional years. There were his enemies, always lurking, always listening, always looking for an opportunity to destroy him. The rejection of Jesus as Messiah, a Savior and King, found ultimate expression when they were asked by Caesar, or asked by, by Pilate, recall, he asked the Pilate asked the people, Shall I crucify your king? Recall the response? With clenched fists and raised voices and eyes bulging red with anger. The Jews, the Pharisees, the Herodians. We have no king but Caesar. Who would have ever thought those words would have come out of the mouths, especially of the Pharisees? This was the ultimate rejection. Pilate felt his hands were tied. For fear of the Jews, he pronounced the death sentence upon Jesus, death by crucifixion. King Jesus experienced rejection by men. But there's one final experience of Jesus which the psalmist points us to. King Jesus experienced vindication by God. It's captured, his vindication is captured in the second half of verse 22. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. 
the one in whom men found no worth, no value, no significance, was demonstrated to be of great worth, of great value, of great significance to God and to all who would trust in him. An empty tomb proves to all who may pay attention that Jesus, in the words of a writer, was not a lunatic, as some believed, nor was he a liar and self-deceived and deceiving the people. But he was Lord and King of all. The empty tomb. Vindication. That Jesus was not a sinner, but the Savior. The empty tomb. Vindication that he was not a criminal, but a king. Sunday of last week prior to his death, the day began with words of Psalm 118 upon the lips of the adoring crowd, welcoming him as king and hoping that he was their king. By Thursday of that same week, it ended with the words of Psalm 118 on Jesus' own lips, reminding him of the experiences which lay ahead. Anguish in a garden, Hostility of the nations, the wrath of God poured out upon him, not for his own sin, but for the sins of others. The rejection of men and ultimately vindication by God. Jesus experienced it all and he endured it all for us. Make no mistake, Jesus was and is a king. Not the kind of king the people wanted, but the kind of king all mankind needed. Jesus did not deliver the Jews from the Roman oppression. But he does make it possible for all who turn to him and trust in him to find deliverance from the oppression of sin and death and Satan. In this, Jesus is unlike any other king. And in that, and for that, May our hearts be filled with joy and praise during this coming week, during this holy week, during this week that is unlike any other week, unique among all the weeks that have ever been lived throughout the history of mankind. The world the vast majority of the people of this planet, the vast majority of the people who have ever lived or ever are living presently or will ever live, have yet to acknowledge Jesus for who he is. They've yet to acknowledge Jesus as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But, but may it not be so with us. Instead, may we acknowledge him, may we worship him, May we crown him as king of our lives to the one who is the lamb upon the throne, the Lord of love, the Lord of life, the Lord of heaven. May we, as the song says, may we crown him with many crowns. May we kneel before him in humble adoration May we worship him as Savior, as Lord, and as King. Would you stand as we sing those words together? Crown him, the King, with many crowns.
Father, we stand before you, we pause before you just to acknowledge your love for us that sent us not the king we wanted, but the king we needed, a savior, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Father, we rejoice in him. Father, we yield our lives to him. Father, we cast what crown we might have before his feet that he might be adored and magnified by each one here this day. Father, we worship you, we praise you, we give you thanks. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Go in peace. You are dismissed.